Welcome to Sunday Morning Worship at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Our Savior's is a congregation of people forgiven in Christ, whose mission is to proclaim the good news and connect faith to everyday life. We are glad you have chosen to worship with us. Our traditional worship will begin in a few moments. Good morning. Lord be with you. Thank you. It is good to see all of you today. Welcome to worship here at Our Saviors. If you're here in person or joining us via television or Facebook Live, we are glad to be together with you today. I invite you to uh, stand as you're able as we do continue with our worship service. We turn our hearts to our confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name, amen. In the mercy of almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As I called an ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Share God's peace.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of goodness, you throw a celebration in the name of your son Jesus, a feast of love for all people. We are happy to accept your invitation to the feast. Now make us of one mind so that we may enjoy whatever is good, whatever is honorable, whatever is just and worthy of praise as we celebrate in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Kids, come on up. Join me on the steps for Kid Talk. Come on up. All right, here they come from all directions. Good to see you. Have a seat up here. There you go. Good morning. Good morning. Have a seat. Good to see all of you today. Wow. I just keep coming and coming and coming. All right. How's everybody today? Pretty good? Huh? Mm -hmm. You're good. All right. Very good. Very good. Well, it is so good to be with you today. I hope you had a good week. Thanks for coming up and spending some time with us up here today, too. And I, just, I have a couple of questions I was going to ask you about today, and they're kind of fun a little bit. The first one is, how many of you have ever written a letter? Yeah? Have you? Have you done it the old-fashioned way, with a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, that's still fun to do. I like to do that. Who who'd you write letters to? Have, who have you written letters to? To your teacher? Is that what you said? Yeah, nice. Uh huh. To your family members? Yeah, that's a great that's a great way to write letters. Yeah. To your friends? Yeah, yeah. We write letters to everybody we care about, right? Don't we? That's fun. I used to love to get letters. I didn't get a lot of them, but you know, we got some, you know, especially like in the holidays and things like that. And I like to send letters too. And you know, there's a group of people at our church that back when we had COVID real bad and we, we weren't getting together so frequently, 
A lot of people in our congregation volunteered to be pen pals to people who live in nursing homes and who are at home alone in their house within our congregation. And they started to write letters to these people. And that meant the world to these people because they were kind of lonesome, especially when they just couldn't get out because of that darn COVID. So they wrote letters. And some of them still do it today. They had so much fun, they kept writing letters to these folks. And they get letters back. And it's just, uh, just a neat way to show their love and support to each other. There was somebody else who wrote letters long ago, and you're going to hear it in the, in, the, in, the, in the readings in just a minute. No, they're not there yet, but that's where they're going to be. All right. They're going to read some scripture. And Paul, Paul's letter to the people in Philippi is one of the letters that they're going to read today. Paul wrote a letter to the people in the church in Philippi because, well, apparently some of the ladies in the church they didn't, they weren't, I don't know if they weren't getting along or what, but Paul told them that they should be of the same mind. He wrote a letter and said, hi, and everything, how you doing? But then he said, you know, I've heard that you, you, you kind of just got to, well, you, you got to get along. So be of the same mind, he said. Now, what he was saying, it wasn't so much that you had to all agree on everything all the time, but he said, be of the same mind. And he said, the same mind in Christ. Now, what did he mean by that? What's it mean to be in the same mind as Jesus. What does that mean? That's a harder question. I think it means maybe to be like Jesus, to try and act like Jesus, to think like Jesus, you know, to do those kind of things that we should do to, to, to live in the example of Jesus. I'm going to read what Paul said just a little bit because they're going to read it again, but I'm going to share with you just a little. Paul wrote in his letter to those people, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now again, what does that mean? What does it mean to have your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus? Does anybody have an idea? Jacob? It means to love Jesus with your whole heart. That's true. That's a good answer. You have to to him too. And you have to listen to him too. That's another good answer. That's right. You kids are great. You know what I'm talking about. You bet. Listen to Jesus. Be of the same mind. Love him. And act like him. And how did Jesus act? Well, Paul kind of reminds us a little bit again. He says, you know, when you think about things, when you're the same mind as Jesus then you're, you're kind of thinking about whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellent, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things, and the peace of God will be with you. I like that part. The peace of God will be with you. Think about good things. In a nutshell, that's what you're saying. Think about good things. You might not always agree on stuff, but love each other, just like Jesus loved everybody and still does. Be good to each other. Think about good things. Do good things. Say good things. Be nice. Be kind. And show your love each day to the people around you. Maybe one of the ways we can do that is by writing letters to people, huh? Maybe you, maybe you should write some more letters to the people that you love and remind them that, they, that, that you love them. Hmm? I bet they'd love to have a letter from you. But whatever it is, each day what you do, keep your mind in Christ Jesus. Live in God's example. And love each other. Let's pray. Dear God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that you love us so much that you show us how to love each other. Help us to remember that each day, God, and to live in your example. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, everybody, okay? You can go back to your seats. Have a wonderful week. Thanks for coming up. Good to see all of you.
God speaks to us in scripture, preaching, song, and prayer. A reading from the Philippians. Therefore, my siblings, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Eurodia and I urge Sintichi to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my coworkers who na whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And God and the God of peace will be with you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look! I prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and they went away. One to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, he destroyed those murderers and he burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited have, were not worthy. So go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find in the wedding banquet. So those slaves went out into the streets, and they gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend... How did you get in here without a wedding robe? And the man was speechless. The king said to his attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. My microphone's kind of like flopping around on my ear this morning. I don't know what's going on. Well, in college, I was an actor and director in an improvisational theater troupe, and we played this game called Exchange Counter. The game requires two actors. One plays the shopkeeper, the other plays the customer, okay? So the customer leaves the room at the beginning of the game, and the shopkeeper receives a suggestion from the audience as to what the customer will buy. The customer doesn't hear the suggestion, and he has to guess based on clues given by the shopkeeper. So this is a game you got to practice if you, like, before you do it in a show, because if you screw it up, like, if you can't figure out what the, the clue is, like, you just flop around. It's very awkward for everyone. So we're in rehearsal. It's not a show. It's just the troupe together play, playing the game. My friend Adam is the shopkeeper, and I'm playing the customer. So I come into the shop, no idea what Adam has that I'm supposed to guess. 
and he does the thing. Hey, how are you doing today? Welcome to my store. Uh, what do you have there today? And I say, oh, I brought this thing. I bought it a few months ago. It's just not working for me, and I'd like to return it. And Adam says, that's great. 100% return policy. He takes it, puts it under the counter. He says, so is there anything else I can get you today? And now here's where I'm supposed to provide the guess, right? So I'm looking at Adam, and I'm thinking, you know what? I'm just, I want to guess Peking duck. Now, do any of you know what Peking duck is? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, like a few of you do. Uh, this is a terrible guess. Because for your first guess in this game, you want to give the shopkeeper something pretty general, but Peking duck, way too specific. It, it's a Chinese dish, but I'll, I'll admit, I have never ordered Peking duck. I've never been around anyone who has. And, and the thought goes through my mind that maybe Adam doesn't even know what it is. Like maybe he thinks Peking duck is like Kung Fu Panda. And, and suddenly he starts giving me clues about a cartoon character or something, and I, I'm, I'm never going to get the answer right. But what the heck, I don't have another idea. So Adam says, what can I get you today? And I just go for it. I don't have any other guess. So I just say, you know what, I'm just really feeling some Peking duck. And, and after this, one of my castmates goes, what? And, and Adam says, Peking duck, that's really what you want today? And I have nothing else. I'm like, yep, give me that Peking duck. And he says, well, you're in luck because I have some right here. <laughs> so in case you don't get it, like somehow I guessed the right answer on the first try. Like this shouldn't even be possible. Like of all the range of possible answers, somehow I guessed the exact one. And Adam's like, what? And, and one of my castmates just instantly is like, he cheated. He heard the answer. And another one says, no, Adam gave him a clue. And Adam's like, I didn't have anything to do with it. And they're like, how did you do it? And I still, to this day, have no idea how. No idea how it worked. But we play games like this to connect with each other, to learn to anticipate one another's needs to the point where some like kind of mind meld happens and you can think and move and act in perfect sync, and that's my best guess, that somehow we had just practiced enough that we had achieved that. Or, or the Holy Spirit gave me that experience so I could think about it for years, like decades, until today. Because that Peking duck moment, it really demonstrates what happens in our scripture today, or at least what should happen in our scripture. Because in that Peking duck moment, Adam and I were living out the dream that St. Paul describes to the Christians at the church in Philippi. We were acting, as St. Paul says, of one mind. Of one mind. When St. Paul uses this phrase, he's obviously not talking about improv comedy troops. He's describing how Christians should aspire to behave with one another. We should be so in sync with each other, so in tune, that we can work together to accomplish a goal without any urging. Like the actor who can guess his teammate's secret objective without trying. The problem is, St. Paul has to urge his friends to behave this way because they absolutely do not. The church in Philippi experiences some real division. There's a, a conflict between two churchgoers, Euodia and Syntyche, and they, can't just, they just can't get along. And it's more than a tiff. It's, it's like a, a feud. It's such a huge conflict that Paul believes these women will still be fighting after he writes the letter out, sticks it in the Roman mail, and it winds its way across the ancient world all the way to them. Like all so many weeks later, they're still going to be fighting. And, and isn't that how it is? Life is a lot more like that than it is like Peking Duck. We are simply not often of one mind. And think of how many places where this is true, where we feel utterly divided from one another. I mean, certainly we could look at our country this way, right? Or, or look at the terror unfolding in Israel and Gaza and how complicated, how ancient, how painful the divisions there are. Then there's that personal painful disunity, the kind 
more like what Paul describes, the, the really personal kind, the breakup that happens when two people who know and love one another, especially people who've been together for years, just suddenly no longer sync up. I bet you know a thing or two about that kind of heartbreaking disunity. And then there's all the disunity we feel in our very own hearts. Like we're not just divided from each other. We're not even of one mind in our very own minds. We don't know what we truly want, or we do, but we struggle to admit it to ourselves. Our true feelings can be terribly confusing to us. We bend over backwards to please others, but then we lose ourselves in the process. We feel torn by our decisions. Man, a friend of mine says her favorite thing to do is when she's shopping for something is to read like every review she can and then not make a decision. And I remember doing this a couple years ago for vacuums. And man, we have approached, if we approach vacuums with this degree of analysis paralysis, how do we handle significant life decisions? Friends, it is hard to be of one mind with each other because we're rarely at one mind with ourselves. And the problem is so bad, it is so thorough, that we absolutely should not be able to live the way St. Paul describes. St. Paul's call to be of one mind should be impossible. But then there's Peking Duck. This little clue from the Holy Spirit that what seems impossible to us is just the way God works. And the way God wants us to work too. So how do we do it? Jesus shows us how to live of one mind in the parable we read today. This parable has two parts to it, really. If it was on the stage, it'd be a two-act play. The first half is when the king invites people, but they don't want to come. And the second part, everyone has arrived for the party who will be there. And that's when the king ejects this party crasher. Okay, these are two halves of the very same story. They may not seem like it at first, but they belong together. And we need both halves to see how we're supposed to live of one mind. So I'm going to break the whole thing down and we'll put it back together again so you can see. Okay? Okay, the first act of this play is the invitation. Now this half is pretty easy to understand. Why does the king invite people? There's an occasion. And the occasion is to celebrate a feast of love for the king's child. So there's a get-together, and there's one purpose. It's it's very simple. It's just a party. But the guests don't want to come. And there's a bunch of reasons why. One person has too much work to do. One person probably doesn't like parties, just an introvert. There's a group of people who kill the king's messengers. The thing to notice about all of these invitations and all of the responses is that this is an invitation that's meant to break down boundaries. The people who killed the king's messengers, they already didn't like the king. And the king knew that town was trouble. The invitation to celebrate is a gesture toward unity. It's a chance to set down the trouble of the world, no matter what that trouble was, and just get together for a happy reason for once. So the king is saying, hey, you have a beef with me. You don't like my policies. It's fine. Put it down for one day and just come and celebrate something happy. Or, hey, I know you have a lot of work to do, but your boss can't get angry if the king invites you to a party, so just take the day off. It's on me. Come and join the celebration. You see, this is an invitation that breaks down boundaries. It gathers people who were once divided and brings them together under a common purpose But it only works if the people want to come. And when no one on the guest list wants to come, the king invites anyone else, anyone the messengers can can find, and they fill up that party. And that's that first half of the story, the first act of the play. And from this, we learn something very simple. To be of one mind, we need a common purpose. And in the church... That purpose is to celebrate the love of Jesus. It's very simple. That's the purpose. Come celebrate the love of Jesus. And once the table is set for that celebration, you got to want to come to the party, <laughs> or else you won't be at the party. Like, it's, it's really that simple, and that's the first act of the play. God throws a party for the people who want to come. That's it. 
To be of one mind, we have to start with that. Hear the invitation and show up to the party. Got it? Okay. The second half of the story is a bit more challenging. Because this is the part where the king throws out the party crasher, and it's confusing because the king just invited anyone who wants to come to the party to come. And this guy, the party crasher, he wanted to come. So why throw him out? Here, that's because Jesus is showing us that it's just not enough to want to show up. Once we're here for the party, we all have to do the same thing or the party can't go on. And Jesus uses the king's rule to illustrate this. The king has a rule at this party. To be at the party, you got to follow the dress code. Everyone has to wear the same robe. That's the rule. That's just, it's very simple. Come as you are, good and bad alike. It doesn't matter who you are or how you act or what you look like. Just come. Just put on the robe once you get here. And we're going to give the generous king the benefit of the doubt and say that at this kind of party, they would give you the clothes even if you didn't show up with them. Like, there's no justice problem here, no equity issue. Like, if you didn't own a fancy wedding robe, they'd give you a loner. And the loner's not going to fit perfectly, but it'll get you in the door, right? Okay, so everyone gets a robe no matter what. And I want you to picture that scene. The party filled the whole big ballroom, the reception hall, the chocolate fondue is flowing, the wine is flowing, the beer is foaming from the tap, the band is playing uptown funk like it's a requirement. All the people who are there want to be there, remember? A whole room full of people who have accepted the invitation, they have gathered together, they have all put on the same clothes except one person. (laughs) And it may seem weird that the king focuses on that one person And their lack of desire to wear the robe. Until we ask what the robe might be. Here's what I think. I think the robe is just whatever the king asked the people to do. Like, the robe itself, like the thing is meaningless. The king could have said, come today wearing chicken masks. Or bring a white elephant gift. The robe thing doesn't matter. What mattered was just doing what the king asked the entire community to do. Because the invitation goes to the community. And the king has a vision of unity for the entire community. For that day's party. And that's the problem with the party crasher the king ejects from the party. He didn't want to do what the king asked the entire community to do. Everyone else listened to the king and puts on the robe. But not this guy. So the king wants him out. All right. Now, let's translate this into like regular church terms so you can actually see how it works. It comes back to that invitation that God gives to a community. And I think in our terms, the way we would talk about it today, the robe is the mission of a church. The mission of a church in a particular place and time. The mission is what the people of a church feel God is calling them to do. It's not the reason you start a church. Remember, that's the the feast. That's the celebration of God's love. That's the invitation. But the robe, the mission, is like saying, well, what do we look like when we show up for the feast? How does this day, this celebration, this gathering, this community look and act differently than any other day or any other celebration? That's the mission. The way we fashion ourselves for the feast of love. The thing is, if one person in the church doesn't want to match the dress code, the whole mission suffers. So what the king asks the people to do in the parable is to care more about the mission than about one person's feelings. And now I've actually seen this happen before. One of my other churches was really big at welcoming everyone. We had a real open and affirming stance toward LGBTQIA2S plus folks. And this became important to us because we had a kid in our youth group who was gay, and he'd been bullied in our youth group for being gay. And we didn't want that to happen to anyone anymore, ever again. So I want you to imagine that we started like passing out metaphorical rainbow robes to everyone. We said, this place has to be a safe place. In our uniform, 
must be welcome. So we worked on that welcome, and it became a thing. Everyone at this church had to know that this was a welcoming place, a place where everyone belonged. But there was this one fella, and he was a longtime church member, and he hated that. And he made that vocally known every time he came to the church. He would make it known at men's Bible studies. He would make it known at congregational meetings. He really banged that drum. He was never going to put on that rainbow robe, and you could not make him do it. His wife was a member too. So the senior pastor checked in with her and was kind of like, do you have any advice about this? And she's like, nope, that is his thing. I like my rainbow robe. I got it on right now. You got to talk to him about this. So he, that's what the pastor did. He pulled him aside, and, he, and, and pastor said to him, look, I, I recognize how you feel. I've heard you. You've said it plenty of times. And I love you. But this church is going to be a place of welcome. And it's going to be that way whether you're here or not. But the thing is, we really can't live out that mission with you here causing all of these problems. And you can disagree with this mission, but you're not going to change it. So I just, I need you to think for a little bit. Are you going to put on the robe? Or maybe you'd be happier somewhere else. I'm, and there's another Lutheran church in town. They line up really well with your personal beliefs. Maybe you should just go check them out and see if you'd be happier there. And wow, that guy was grumpy. And he grumbled about the pastor throwing him out of his own church where he'd given all this money. And he grumbled his way right over to the other church and he ground those molars all the way into, into, that, into that other sanctuary. And we still loved and cared for that guy. His wife still came to our church, so we check in on him every once in a while. And you know what? That guy really liked that other church. <laughs> he felt at home there. And he could have stayed with us unhappy and grumpy. But that didn't serve the mission of our church. And it certainly didn't serve him. Here's the thing. We know from all of our time in church that church can accomplish almost anything when we pull together with a common purpose, a common mission. And this is true for any church anywhere, not just ours. But the problem is that in any given church, you don't just have one guy who shows up in the wrong robe. Ask St. Paul. When Paul writes to the church in Philippi, he's desperate to see the Christians of one mind. But Euodia, she's, got, she's come wearing a blue robe these days. And Syntyche, she's got her yellow robe on. And Clement, you know, Clement's starting to think about a different cut and color for all the robes in general. And what Paul is saying is, whoa, 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 hold on. We agreed on the robes before. Why, why can't we do that now? And if this happened at the church where St. Paul was the pastor, how could it be any different at ours? We are called around the same table to celebrate the feast of God's child, but, and we all have to want to be here. Good job, you're here today. But wanting to be here isn't enough. Once we are here, we all have to consent to the same mission or else the party won't go on. The fact is, we might not even know what robe we're supposed to wear <laughs> at our Savior's Lutheran Church. And we need time to ask about the robe, to consider what feels most natural. And today, in, in this in this era of our life together, we actually have the time to do that. Because we're in the interim period now. We're on the hunt eventually for a new senior pastor, but today we get to think about who we are and what we do and how we serve God and why. We get to think about the fashion that we bring to the celebration. We get to ask what feels right what cut, what color, what style best expresses our personality as a congregation. We want to celebrate the same party, but what makes this church look different, distinctive? If think about it for yourself. When you think about just like one thing about this church that stands out, like what is your Peking duck? 
if you have no idea, or if you have no idea what your neighbor would say, then we're probably wearing different robes. And that's okay for now. But as the church of God, we are called to live as one mind. And when we do not, we need to lovingly ask how and why we do not. And we must answer this question or our core purposes will suffer. If we say our church welcomes everyone but one person spews hatred, we're not wearing the same robe. If we say we value children but nobody volunteers to help with Sunday school, we're not wearing the same robe. If we say we feed the poor but nobody buys the food, we're not wearing the same robe. And we must ask, what holds us back from this common purpose? What would bring us back together again? Only by asking these questions intentionally, carefully, graciously, will we know who we are and how we can serve God in the years ahead. At the end of the day, this is necessary work because our invitation is to celebrate. But there's a dress code at the party. God gives us the privilege of contributing some input to consider what robe does fit us best. How do we make sure everyone gets that robe? And how soon can we decide? And these are energizing questions, exciting questions, because we are here for the party, but the dance can't begin until everyone suits up. My friends, it is time to pick out some robes. Because we got celebrating to do. I invite you to stand as you're able and let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in the transformative powers of Christ, let us pray for the Church and the world and for all according to their needs. Let us pray. We pray, O God, for your Church in this and every land, especially in those places where wars rage and your people are in harm's way. May your people hold each other in prayer and do what we can to show our support and love. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray, O God, for our world. We pray for an end to the wars in Israel and Gaza and Ukraine and wherever else violence rages and people suffer. Unite the leaders of nations to work for peace and justice and teach us to seek your ways in our own lives so that those around us may know your love. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for your creation, for green pastures and still waters and all the beauty of the natural world, that creation flourishes and humankind lives in right relationship with all you've made. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for all experiencing valleys of illness and grief, that they be healed and comforted and find rest in the presence of the Good Shepherd who walks beside them. We pray for the hospitalized and for those requesting our prayers, for Eldon Nelson, Joanne Lemmy, John Lyne, Sharon Trumbull, John Moe, Arthur Dahl Ingman, Rosie Fink, and for Stacy and Sherry Rothenberger upon the death of Stacy's sister-in-law, Teresa Hosen, and for Brian and Betsy Siddick upon the death of Brian's mother, Dorothy. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for this community of believers that the love of Christ may keep us united and make us mindful of all that is true and honorable and just. Strengthen us as we look to the future and the ministry that we share together as your people. God of grace, hear our prayer. Gracious God, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your unending love and amazing grace through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We now receive our offering and uh, invite kids to come forward and grab a noisy offering bucket. They're over there by the playground. And uh, come on up, kids. Our offering is received. Please pray with me. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. 
You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we may be for the world signs of your gracious presence. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able and please join me in our communion dialogue. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection has opened to us the ways of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. As we prepare to come now to God's table, we remember that it was on the night in which he was betrayed that Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. The word that spoke all of creation into being has also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus invites you to this table. Come, eat, and live. You may be seated. Come, for all is ready.
Thank you for joining us in worship at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. For more information about Our Saviors, please visit our website at oslchurch.com and like us on Facebook. We invite you to join us again next Sunday morning. Until next time, may God's abundant love and blessings empower you to share the good news of Jesus Christ.